tonight. Uncovering motive. Authorities probe motive behind Trump's assassination attempt as suspect Thomas Crooks remain under investigation. Naval exercise. China and Russia begin joint naval exercise in southern China amid NATO's criticism of Beijing. Case dismissed. Judge dismisses Alec Baldwin's involuntary manslaughter case, citing prosecutors hiding evidence. Golden Goose. Leading canine heroes in sniffing out drugs, guns and money at US borders amid fentanyl crisis. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Adha Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and welcome to World News Tonight. Today, we dwell deep into the current affairs of global affairs and our top story focuses on the shocking assassination attempt on Trump. Continuing their investigation into the assassination attempt on the former President Donald Trump, authorities search for answers as to why Thomas Crooks, the main suspect, carried out the attack. This is Thomas Crooks, the man named by the FBI as the person who shot at former US President Donald Trump during a campaign rally. After the incident, police closed off the streets around Crooks' home, where bomb-making materials were discovered, according to law enforcement officials. Bomb-making materials were also reportedly found inside Crooks' vehicle. Residents were ordered to evacuate the area. Crooks, age 20, grew up in a quiet suburb in Pennsylvania. He can be seen in this video. Thomas Crooks. The video shows him collecting his diploma at the end of high school two years ago. According to state voter records, he was a registered Republican and had also donated $15 to a Democratic Political Action Committee. In his hometown, some of his former classmates described him to reporters as a young man who kept to himself. We started seeing pictures online of him and we were like, wow, this, this is insane. He was bullied, sat alone at lunch, is pretty much that. You don't want to have that first thought in your head like, he's a little off, is he going to do something? According to public court records, Crooks had no past criminal cases against him. Staying on the topic of Trump's assassination attempt, reactions from all around the world poured in as world leaders expressed their opinions on the incident. More on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent Suzanne Shanali from Toronto in Canada. Yes, Sanavi, global leaders quickly condemned the assassination attempt on former President Donald Trump at his campaign rally in Pennsylvania. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau expressed his disgust, stating that political violence is unacceptable. European leaders, including the UK's Keir Starmer and French President Emmanuel Macron, shared their support and wished Trump a speedy recovery. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida emphasized the threat such violence on democracy. In the Middle East, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan also denounced the attack. Back to you, Sanavi. Thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Susan Shanali from Toronto in Canada. According to reports by Chinese media, China and Russia began a joint naval exercise in the southern China. The Chinese Defense Ministry stated the operation is unrelated to international or regional situations and doesn't target any third party. The Chinese and Russian navies began a joint exercise in Guangdong province, expected to last until mid-July, demonstrating their capabilities in addressing security threats and preserving peace. The exercise includes anti-missile drills, sea strikes and air defense. Following an opening ceremony in Zhangjiang, they conducted military simulations and tactical coordination exercises. This comes amid China's recent tensions with NATO, which labeled China a decisive enabler of Russia's Ukraine war. China responded by accusing NATO of seeking security at others' expense and warned against bringing chaos to Asia. Heading over to Southeast Asia, recent clashes in northeastern Myanmar have intensified as two new ethnic minority militias, the United WA State Army and Shan State Army North, joined the fray, complicating the conflict and highlighting long-standing tensions for autonomy from the central government. Ethnic armed groups in Myanmar, including TNLA and MNDAA, are advancing on Lashio, 
focusing on their territorial goals despite alliances with pro-democracy forces. The Va State Army and the Shan State Army North have moved troops into Lashio area, hindering the offensive by TNLA and MNDAA. The Va Army, with about 30,000 soldiers and sophisticated weaponry, aims to prevent the conflict from spreading. The TNLA and the MNDAA are part of three Brotherhood Alliance, which seized territory last October. The current fighting marks the end of a Chinese brokered ceasefire. Taking a look at China, the third plenary session of the 20th Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party kicks off today for four days behind closed doors in Beijing. This takes place amid economic challenges including a property crisis, weak domestic demand and trade barriers. In what is one of the Chinese Communist Party's most important political meetings, it will be presided over by President Xi Jinping and is expected to focus on deepening economic reforms, especially as the country is struggling to fully recover after COVID. The government is also expected to discuss its intention to support and foster high-tech industries and its AI development policy. In addition, in a bid to revitalize the real estate market, financial support and tax reform may be discussed. Now, the third plenum is the third of seven plenary sessions held during the party's five-year term. King Charles III and Queen Camilla are set to visit Australia and Samoa in October as the king takes on more public duties while receiving cancer treatment. The pair will carry out engagements in the Australian Capital Territory and New South Wales before heading to Samoa for a Commonwealth Summit. The royal family confirmed that King Charles and Queen Camilla will visit Canberra and New South Wales with further details to be announced. They will also attend the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Samoa from October 21st to 25th. This visit follows Prime Minister Anthony Albanese's earlier confirmation of the King's plans to visit Australia. It will be the first visit by a reigning monarch to Australia since Queen Elizabeth II in 2011. The visit marks King Charles and Queen Camilla's first trip to Australia since 2018 and it is notable for being the first chogam hosted by a Pacific nation, Samoa. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Tonight on the road to the White House, President Joe Biden warned of political violence after the attempted assassination of former President Trump, urging Americans to resolve differences peacefully and reject violence. His address followed increased violence rhetoric online after a recent attack at a Trump rally. The U.S. Secret Service is investigating the circumstances surrounding an assassination attempt on former President Donald Trump during a rally in Pennsylvania on Saturday local time. Authorities identified the gunman who attacked Trump as Thomas Matthew Crooks, a 20-year-old man from Pittsburgh. CNN reported that Crooks fired at Trump from a building rooftop outside the rally's security perimeter before he was killed by the Secret Service. The FBI says he acted alone using an AR-style rifle believed to have been bought by his father and there are currently no public safety concerns. According to the New York Times, Crooks came from a typical middle-class background with mixed political views. He was registered as a Republican while his mother was a Democrat and his father a Libertarian. In a primetime national address from the Oval Office on Sunday, U.S. President Joe Biden warned of the risks of political violence in the U.S., saying it's time to cool it down. My fellow Americans, I want to speak to you tonight about the need for us to lower the temperature in our politics. And to remember, while we may disagree, we are not enemies. You know, the political record in this country has gotten very heated. It's time to cool it down. Earlier Sunday, Biden condemned the attempt assassination of Trump, calling for the nation to come together as one and announcing an independent security review to investigate how the attack occurred. Trump's aide said he was in great spirits and doing well after the shooting, which resulted in an injury to his right ear. According to the Butler County District Attorney, one spectator at the rally died in the shooting while another is in a serious condition. Trump took to social media some 13 hours after the shooting to thank those who prayed for him and urged Americans to stand united and show their true character as Americans. 
Trump also stated he would stick to his schedule despite the shooting. He arrived in Milwaukee on Sunday for the Republican National Convention, where he is set to be named the party's presidential nominee later this week. Nearly 600,000 homes and businesses in the Houston area remained without power six days after Hurricane Beryl made landfall in Texas, with fierce winds and rain that knocked down trees and electricity infrastructure. Houston resident Deborah Powell is one of many Texans still feeling the effects of Hurricane Beryl days after it made landfall. Eight times you have to suffer, but we're suffering right now. Beryl's fierce winds and rain cut the 72-year-old's power and caused her ceiling to fall in. While Powell regained power two days after the storm, several of her neighbors aren't as lucky. Nearly 600,000 customers were still without power as of Saturday afternoon, according to Centerpoint Energy, the largest power provider in Texas. It comes as the heat index topped 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Some impacted residents said they were considering traveling out of town for the weekend, unable to cope with the lack of power and heat. Powell says the city needs to do more. Now, you know, I know me, I just got in there, so I'm not going to down here. But it's something Mayor Whitmire and everybody else that's connected with the city and the lights, center point, is something they have to do. A 2023 study by the U.S. Department of Energy and some national labs showed that the median home in Houston would be habitable for four days during a heat event without power. Centerpoint says it continues to work day and night and expects to restore 85 percent of impacted customers by the end of the day on Sunday. It adds, since Monday, their crews have replaced over 2,000 poles and addressed damage from more than 6,000 trees impacting lines and other electrical equipment. Heading over to Africa, millions of Rwandans are heading to the polls today, with President Paul Kagame expected to secure an easy victory due to severe restrictions on opposition figures. Parliamentary elections are also taking place, with more than 500 candidates vying for 80 seats. Rwanda's general election begins on Monday with the country's incumbent president, Paul Kagame, widely expected to win a fourth term. 66-year-old Kagame, who has served as Rwanda's president since 2000, faces only two political rivals, both with weak campaigns and little support. Six other potential candidates were not cleared to run by the state-run electoral commission. Kagame won nearly 99% of the vote in the country's last election in 2017. A 2015 referendum lifted term limitations for presidents, technically allowing Kagame to remain in power until 2034. It also shortened presidential terms from seven to five years. While Kagame's regime has been criticized by rights groups as autocratic for muzzling the media, stifling political opponents and backing rebel groups in neighboring Congo, Kagame enjoys popular support at home. Israel said it targeted Hamas's shadow of military commander in a massive strike in the southern Gaza Strip that, according officials, killed at least 71 people. It was not immediately known whether Mohammed Daif was among the dead. But Israel officials confirmed that he and a second Hamas commander, Rafa Salama, were the targets. It was supposed to be a refuge for displaced Palestinians, but Gaza health officials say Al Mawasi camp has become the scene of a bloodbath after it was targeted by an Israeli strike. The strike hit near Khan Yunis, but it's still unclear whether or not it landed inside the camp itself. Some witnesses have described seeing several strikes. An Israeli official has told the Associated Press that the attack targeted the head of Hamas's military wing in Gaza, Mohammed Deif. In the aftermath, Dead bodies along with injured Palestinians were taken here to Nasser Hospital, close to where the attack took place. Al Mawasi is home to hundreds of thousands of displaced people who fled to the camp in search of safety. It's a tiny strip of land with very basic facilities. Elsewhere, in Gaza City, the Israeli army announced on Friday it was withdrawing from several districts after a week-long offensive that left rubble and ruin in its wake. Health officials say dozens of bodies have already been pulled from the wreckage of homes. UN chief Antonio Guterres says the suffering of Palestinians is worsening every day.
Just when we thought it couldn't get any worse in Gaza, somehow, appallingly, civilians are being pushed into ever deeper circles of hell. Guterres accused Israel of issuing evacuation orders that force Palestinians to move like human pinballs across a landscape of destruction. Alec Baldwin's involuntary manslaughter trial was dismissed after a judge found key evidence potentially favourable to Baldwin was held by police and prosecutors. The case involved the fatal shooting of cinematographer Helen Hutchins on the Rush set. Dramatic scenes in the Santa Fe court as Alec Baldwin's involuntary manslaughter trial is dismissed. The Hollywood star had been accused of violating firearms guidelines when fatally shooting cinematographer Helena Hutchins on the set of the Western Rust in October 2021. Baldwin maintains the shooting was an accident. The judge ruled that the prosecution had failed to submit evidence that may have favoured the defendant. The prosecution was alleged to have withheld evidence in the form of ammunition, which could have shown that the prop supplier and not the film's production was at fault for live rounds ending up on set. The prosecutor, while accepting the court's decision, disagreed with this interpretation. Baldwin could have faced up to 18 months in prison if found guilty. He cannot now face trial on the same charges. The film's armourer, who was sentenced to 18 months for involuntary manslaughter in March, is also expected to file to have her conviction overturned. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Welcome back. One of America's most valuable defenders against fentanyl trafficking at the Mexico border uses his nose to root out illicit drugs, an old-school technique that authorities say is a key to reducing the flow of deadly synthetic opioids. Goose the Golden Retriever is demonstrating how he searches for fentanyl and other drugs. Suddenly, he stops and sits. That's the cue. Oh, good boy! The dog is one of more than 500 U.S. Customs and Border Protection canines trained to sniff out drugs, guns, ammunition, money, and hidden passengers at America's land border crossings, airports, and seaports. In 2017, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, or CBP, took the unprecedented step of training drug-sniffing dogs to detect fentanyl after seeing a rise in the illicit drug and the epidemic of related overdoses that followed. An estimated 75,000 people died from synthetic opioid overdoses in 2023, according to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Most involved fentanyl. The canine program has proved crucial to the agency's efforts. The vast majority of CBP fentanyl seizures occur at legal border crossings in Arizona and California and involve canines. Most convicted fentanyl traffickers in recent years have been U.S. citizens. At ports like San Isidro in California, millions of dollars in technology allows CBP to scan vehicles and analyze data, targeting possible smugglers. But it's here that the canine's noses shine. Dogs have a sense of smell that is exponentially more powerful than humans. They have up to 200 times more olfactory receptors, according to a 2022 study published in the peer-reviewed Journal of Neuroscience. That means they can rapidly sweep through vehicle traffic, search suspicious cars, and check lines of passengers. They are particularly useful for uncovering fentanyl, which can be moved in small quantities as pills or powder. So well. At the CBP Field Operations Canine Academy in Front Royal, Virginia, this pooch is learning to sniff out the drug in an airport setting. When customs officers from across the country arrive, they're paired with their new four-legged partners. It's part of a four- to six-month process to teach the dogs how to seek out the contraband. Before CBP could start training on fentanyl, the agency needed to develop safety protocols. Trainers always carry four doses of the opioid overdose drug naloxone, which can also be administered to dogs. Sifford says it hasn't been needed so far. 
Still, the dogs have limitations. They can typically only be out searching vehicles or people for about 20 minutes before they need a break. Drug-sniffing canines can also send false alarms, with studies showing a range of effectiveness. And while CBP's fentanyl seizures increased in recent years, the agency only appears to intercept a small percentage coming into the U.S. That's it from all of us at World News Tonight for this Monday night. Now on a programming note, the nightly business report, which is to air soon after, will not air tonight, as we give way for a special look at the Paris 2024 Olympic Games, which will get underway next week. Also note that there will be a special World News Tonight special on the Republican National Convention, which gets underway shortly. That will air tomorrow night, hosted by Maish Johnny. For tonight, thank you for joining. I am Sonia Mulan Nayaka. Good night.